I'm Pastor Grace Marie, and well, I want to say it's good to see you, but I actually can't see you. We're in the sanctuary here on Wednesday afternoon, so this is prior to the beginning of the at-home, stay-at-home order. So we might see you from our homes next week. I'm sad that we won't get to see some of you through our car windows as we had planned a drive-in worship for the next two weekends, but that cannot happen anymore with this current order. And also what we are celebrating in our homes is Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, which are coming up. So please keep watch on um, this YouTube channel for links to Monday, Thursday service and a Good Friday service. Those special services will be posted online. I want to remind you that our link to giving is in the description of this video. And I want to thank you 
for keeping everyone safe and staying in your homes. It is a difficult thing to do, but it's what we must to care for one another. Let's pray as we continue to worship. God, we give you thanks that our voices are not taken away, that we can still cry out to you in our prayers, that we can still sing to you with our voices, that we can still speak to you. Be with us in these moments that though we are worshiping apart, we may feel as one, a part of the body of Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 12, verses beginning with verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hosanna, we read about a parade today in the scripture. And I bet most of you have been to a parade. Maybe different parades. Some where you are standing shoulder to shoulder, waiting, craning your neck for the parade to start, waiting for that first car. Oftentimes it's the mayor, right? Or the parade marshal, whomever that is. Some parades start with um, the flag, people holding the flag and processing. But as you're standing there waiting for a parade, you know it's coming. And it's that anticipation of what you will see, the excitement of what is coming. So what do you do while you're standing there waiting for a parade? Well, we do a lot of things, right? What were the people doing when they were standing there waiting for Jesus? They were throwing their cloaks on the ground. They were, they were shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. And they were waiting. They knew that he was coming. And they knew, they believed that Jesus was going to save them. Now, as you are standing there waiting for a parade with all of the excitement, how do you feel when the parade passes? You may feel happy. You may feel excited that you got to witness the parade. You may feel a little bit sad because the parade is over. But these persons that were standing at the edge of the road, waiting for Jesus to come and shouting, Hosanna, save us. What happened when the parade ended for them? Well, Jesus didn't save them immediately, did he? Nor did he save them in often the, the way that they were thinking that he would save them, by taking over an earthly throne. And actually, things got worse before they got better, didn't they? 
Everything was so jubilant and exciting on what we call Palm Sunday, this day that Jesus rode through. And then there is Passion Week, Holy Week, as we call it, where Jesus was arrested, tortured, hung on a cross to die. And so these people that were calling Jesus to save them had to live through something worse before it got better. And he actually did that act of saving us by dying and rising again. So here we are all. Here we all are. Cramped together, house to house, right? We're not standing on the side of a road waiting for a parade, but we're sitting in our homes waiting for what? We know that the worst is yet to come. We know that this is not over. And yet we still shout Hosanna because we know that Jesus saves. We know that we will still walk through a dark valley before we get to the resurrection of Easter. But it is that hope that we have at the beginning of parade, believing that the parade will come, knowing that we are a victorious people that will sustain us through this time. And we don't know, we can't rush this time. We don't know how long this will last. And so I pray that we can all settle in to our new normal. Find different ways for outlets of exercise and laughing and connection with those we love. And just remember that Victory Parade is coming. And Jesus saves. Amen.
away Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away join me now as we move into a time of prayer. God, we ask that your presence be felt more than it has ever been felt before. Surrounding each one of us. As we live through history in these uncertain times. God, our list of prayers is so long. We think about the healthcare workers who risk their lives every day. We think about the essential workers who are reconfiguring what they usually produce to produce things that the healthcare industry needs. We think about those persons who are quarantined at home, sick, praying that their family doesn't get it. We think about those persons who are just staying at home and now worrying about the bills that they might not be able to pay. God, we come to you with many burdens on our hearts. But we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We are grateful that you are the same God, today, tomorrow, forever. That even though we will all come out of this a little bit different, you will not, that your strength is steadfast, your love is steadfast, your providence is steadfast. Give us all patience. Give us all your strength to follow your heart. We praise you, God, for the gift of your son, Jesus, who came to save us, to save the world from our own sins so that we might be able to relish in our relationship with you in times like this. We pray for those persons whose hopes and dreams have been either postponed or canceled. God, for all of us, help us to lean on you and to care for each other in this time, to check in on our neighbors to sing songs to you. We pray for quiet hearts filled with your peace. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, kids. 
good to see you, even though I can't see you, you can see me. But I, I imagine you're kind of bumming, some of you. Um, we were hoping there was going to be an Easter egg hunt. That's always tons of fun to watch you running around the churchyard. Uh, we expected there was going to be a drive-in worship service, and, and that couldn't take place. But um, thank you so much for tuning in. If you've ever seen pictures of a king or a queen, uh, sometimes you see them wearing a, a crown, right? And some of them are very fancy, some that even have precious rubies and jewels and things that are, that are on there, uh, really to show that they have authority and they have power, that they're, they're royal. A uh, crown represents royalty. But if you remember when Jesus was crucified, that he was wearing a different kind of crown, wasn't he? That um, those Roman soldiers had actually taken a crown that was made out of thorns and um, taken it, pushed it down upon his head, and they laughed at him, and they mocked him, and told him, oh, king, we'll bow down to you, but it was all in mock worship. Uh, this is an amazing week in the life of the church, and even though we can't be here in person, we remember what Jesus did for us and how he was willing to go to that cross. So my hope is that you wouldn't mock him or, or laugh at him, but man, you would recognize what an amazing king he is, king of love, who laid down his life for you because he loves you so much. You know, one day we'll be able to see him in heaven and I'm sure whatever he's wearing on his head, it's going to be a lot more spectacular than this. But it's because of this kind of crown that he wore that we'll be able to see him. So let's keep trusting him, okay? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you. You didn't need to go to that cross, but you did that out of your amazing love for us. Now help us. For this we pray in your holy name. Amen. And I'm going to let you know later on in the service as I'm doing my sermon, I'm dressing up in character. And um, the person that I'm portraying, Malchus, is really not mentioned in Scripture much. And so some of what I'm sharing is historical fact. Some of it is from background information surrounding that period of time. But some of it is also creative liberties from the pastor. So I just wanted to give you a heads up before that happens. So. Thank you.
The scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 22, verses 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. You know, sometimes in life, it's not so much what you know, but who you know. There's some people who have great paying jobs, and they've worked hard in school. They worked their way up the ranks through a company, through determination and effort. They made something of themselves. But you know what? There are some other people who really didn't do much. It's just they knew somebody or they knew somebody who knew somebody that got them a great job. Now, I might be going out on a limb here, but stop for a moment and consider my master, Caiaphas. You may think that he became the high priest of the nation of Israel because of his great understanding of the Torah or his strict adherence to Mosaic law or his holy living. <laughs> uh, no. The only reason my master became the high priest is because Annas is his father-in-law. I mean, Annas is really the one in charge here. In fact, in his lifetime, Annas appointed five different family members to become high priest for the nation of Israel. So Caiaphas, even though he's my master, he isn't his own man. You know what he is? He's a puppet. And Annas pulls one string, and Rome pulls the other string, and he pretty much does whatever they tell him to do. Now, I'm not saying it's an easy job. I mean, having to be the one who oversees the temple and the commerce and the activity and the, the busyness that's there. It's, a, it's crazy. I mean, especially when Passover is going on and you need to dictate to others what they can do and what they can't do. And you're the one who makes the decisions on what money is to be saved and what money is to be spent. He wasn't an easy man to work for. In fact, that day that, that Nazarene ended up flipping tables in the marketplace, Caiaphas went ballistic. He, he was nuts. See, you didn't want to mess with the system. Well, enough about Caiaphas. You might be wondering a little bit about me. The name's Malchus. But you know, there's not a whole lot to tell. I was born into slavery. Now, my father ran this incredible pottery shop in Jerusalem, some of the most beautiful pottery you could ever lay your eyes on. And some people would travel for miles just to get some of his work. But you know, the Roman Empire, they believed in imminent domain. Wherever their feet went, that was their domain. 
And they decided that my father's pottery shop would be just an incredible place to have a a Roman tax office. So not only did they throw my father out on his ear, they took all of his pottery and they smashed it out in the streets. And there is my father no longer having a potter's wheel, no longer able to work, no longer able to feed his family. And things got so bad, it it looked like we were all going to be thrown into debtor's prison. But instead of seeing us die, uh, my father decided the best choice of action would be to sell himself and all of us into slavery. And so that's how I became slave to the high priest Caiaphas. In some ways, he was a pompous windbag. In some ways, all he ever thought about was himself. I guess he was just trying to do his job the best he knew how. And sometimes that's pretty hard, isn't it? One evening, I I was working late. I had the the meal just ran late, and I was cleaning up things, and uh, this knock came at the door, which normally those late hours, you never had that happen. And as I opened the door to see who it was, it was one of those Nazarenes, a shady character. Found out later his name was Judas. And, you know, I, I tried to occupy myself with, with other things and, and going and doing, but, you know, sometimes you're just in earshot and you overhear things that maybe you wish you hadn't heard. But I heard that Nazarene say this to my master, how much money will you give me if I hand him over to you? And when I heard the response, it made my blood boil. Because you know how much Caiaphas told Judas he he would give him to sell his master? 30 pieces of silver. Now, you might wonder, well, what's wrong with that? Don't you know what 30 pieces of silver could do? I mean, 30 pieces of silver was the cost of a slave. And if I had 30 pieces of silver, I wouldn't be in this mess. If I had those 30 pieces of silver, I would be free. But no, Caiaphas agrees. Yes, that's the price. You bring him to me and and we'll take care of you. Man, I I didn't know what to expect. I I didn't know what was coming next. But eventually that, that Thursday evening came. Now, Caiaphas, he didn't want to get messed up in that nasty affair of arresting Jesus and He wanted to make sure he still had his pulse on whatever was happening, so guess who he decided to send? None other than his slave. And so I went with this, well, it seemed like a massive crowd to me. There are guys carrying torches. There are guys carrying swords and clubs. There are guys who are carrying shackles and chains, almost like we were going to war. But there was Judas who met us, and he led us up through uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And there are people camped out all over the place. We, we never could have found Jesus had it not been for him. And he makes his way over, and he gives Jesus a kiss. And that was a sign. That was how we were to know who he was. There are people who are asking, you know, who are you? Are are you Jesus the Christ? And uh, he would respond, but but nobody was doing anything. Everybody was just standing around. And, you know, I'm one of those guys who who likes to make things happen. And so I figured, hey, if nobody else here is going to come to start to arrest this guy, then I'm going to do it myself. So I I walked over just to grab hold of him. and, And from out of nowhere, this 
burly fisherman like jumps up, pulls out his sword, and he swings it. And as he swings the sword, I, I start to duck to get out of the way, but I wasn't fast enough. And the sword sliced my ear right off. Man, if you've ever had a head wound, you, you know, just blood comes everywhere. And, and so th- there I was down on the ground just, just holding on to my ear. Blood is gushing everywhere. And, and I don't know what to expect, what's, what's going to happen next. But Jesus turned to that Galilean and he said, put down your sword. Don't you know if you're going to try to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword? You know, I really expected Jesus when he stooped down to pick that sword up. But you know what he picked up? He he picked up my ear. And and he didn't have any ointment. He didn't have any medicine. He just, he touched my ear and he healed me. The ringing stopped, the the bleeding stopped, and it was whole. You know, I don't know about you, but if somebody pushes me, I push them back. And if somebody hits me, I'm going to hit them. And I went to harm this guy, but he doesn't harm me. What does he do? He, He heals me. And even though... All of those temple guards and all those people seized Jesus and they they carried him away. I didn't go with him. I just knelt there in shock, trying to wrap my mind around this entire thing and what had happened and, and what I saw. How amazing. When I was lashing out, that someone would would love me. You know, it wasn't until later I found out a little bit more about who this Jesus was. In fact, that big burly fisherman that cut my ear off, I, I came to know him quite well. And I heard him preach on that day of Pentecost stood up and shared what people had to do to be saved, how they needed to trust, and how Jesus had died on that cross and how he came back from the dead. You know, you might be thinking, what what an amazing miracle. I mean, take a look at that, that ear. I mean, you're not going to find a scar. You're not going to see any deformities. It's It's... Perfect. But you know that miracle that you can see on the outside isn't anything compared to the miracle he did on the inside. For you see, I was filled with so much hatred. I hated Caiaphas, I hated his family, I hated the Roman Empire, I hated my life, I hated enslavement, I had such low self-esteem, I I wanted nothing to do with anything. But as I came to know who Jesus was, well, you know what? I was no longer a slave. I was still a slave to Caiaphas, mind you, but... On the inside, I I was a free man because I experienced a love and life like I, I never, ever have before. And you know, for you, if you put your life in his hands, you can experience that same freedom. You can experience that, that life and that, that hope. I'm really not sure what's keeping you confined right now, of what's holding you in bondage. Uh, maybe even as you're facing this pandemic right now, you, you feel so trapped and you wonder, man, am I ever going to be free? But Jesus still brings freedom. Freedom from silt, 
from sin and freedom from guilt and freedom from bondage to our past and freedom to live a life that is filled with, with hope and with joy and with peace. So may you take some time even right now to trust him, to invite him to bring freedom to you. Yeah, you know, sometimes in life it's not what you know, it's, it's who you know. And I know Jesus, and that makes all the difference. Do you know him? Pray with me. Oh, Lord Jesus, help each of us not to be held in bondage to our past, to feel enslaved or trapped or isolated. But Lord, make us free, free to love, free to receive the forgiveness and the eternal life you offer each one of us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the power that we have of forgiveness of sin, a power to be loved by you and to love you in return. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Glorious One, Glorious One, Light of the world, You outshine the sun, King of all kings, Eternity sings, Glorious One. God bless you. Amen.